Thank you, Lionel. I also want to thank Michelle for co-sponsoring the event. And then Mr. Russo, our loyal Tom, loyal shareholder. If you hadn't bumped into Gaynor at Alfred's and told her that you're coming here, especially for the speech, my toothache was growing and I might just have missed your conference here, Mr. Barth. Because this is, he caught me, but luckily apparently also uh, John Elkin at the Google conference last year and persuaded us to come here. Those things where a year in advance you say yes, and then it gets closer and you think, did I say that last night? Any case. And then when I looked at the list of the speakers and the attendees, I realized that I had a big problem. Because normally if I speak to golfers, I speak about the economy. If I speak to economists, I speak about golf. But I'll always pick a subject that the audience, that I'm a little bit better. Here I've got issues. But, you know, you chose this technology legacy. I started in luxury goods by accident in 1976. I was working for Lazards in New York. And now remember in those days, we had no internet, no mobile phones. Forget laptops. We had no portable music. It was before the Walkman. No video streaming, no satellite TV, no flat screens. But we had Studio 54, for those of you who are old enough to remember that. David, you and I are probably the only two who remember that, David Tang. And we enjoyed life, we didn't know about all these wondrous things that were going to change our lives. Now, how did I get into luxury goods? There was a gentleman who already owned a Bugatti before the war, Mr. Robbie Ock, Jewish. He joined the resistance. He got thrown into Bichenwald. After the war, he came out, and because of his resistance, uh, because the old people who fought, uh, they were given deals, contracts. So he dealt with second-hand tires with the East Bloc. And through that, he worked with petrochemicals and he designed the first plastic lighter, silver match, before Bic or Gillette. And that's where Alain Dominique Perrin started. He sold plastic lighters out of briefcases. But in those days, Mr. Hock designed another thing. He designed a Cartier lighter. And the genius of it was the problem with lighters in those days was that the valve kept on leaking and breaking. So he designed a valve in a tube that was disposable or removable. So you brought your lighter back, they fixed it, gave it back to you. And after a year, he found out he was making more money than Cartier, Paris. So they bought Cartier Paris, then they bought Cartier London. Then they came to the United States and they ran out of money. And we met through Lazard and through friends. And we, our family, my father's company bought it. There's still a dispute whether it's seven million uh, that joke, the late joke, and we said, or nine that I said, but we bought it from rapid American, Piazza Dora's husband, the first junk bond king. But in those days, you couldn't fill a room like this if you advertised for 10 years. I mean, luxury goods was not sexy. It was actually perfect, because nobody was interested in buying. And certainly we did not have Mr. Arnaud, Mr. Pino, or private equity, chasing. So when Mr. Hock died in, uh, in a car accident in 79, uh, we had preemptive rights over all of the shares, but my father was not interested. So Lazards went around, and well, I can't remember who it was, and they went to John Elkin, who's speaking tomorrow's grandfather. 
En dan leidt andere meier of Lazar, sê het hem nou, Janne, jou ges, jy ges businessman, jou maak automobiel. Sie is luxury, it is a joke. Until his death, the avocado kept on saying to me, what a mistake. He declined, but in those days, it was not a sexy business. But I went and started a bank in South Africa, and I think it's important because I want to just say how we started, what I did, the changes that I saw, what happened in the economy and the ecology, and where we are in the future. I went and started a merchant bank in Johannesburg, and we repriced 98% of the market because we only had a 2% market share, and we were the most hated place on earth. Uh, we started the, uh, we call them promissory notes, but we started uh, commercial paper market and we were the kings. We had a Black and Scholes uh, student, uh, so we ran the bond market for eight years there. We called it a legalized way of transferring wealth from the relatively sophisticated to the truly sophisticated. And this lasted for a number of years. And then my dad, I couldn't stand any, because he was having problems uh, with some of his colleagues, so I joined him in 84. But we were also the first partners in a software company, and we were the first Apple importers at the bank. Steve Jobs, I'm talking about 85, 86, these little Macs, Going from that to luxury goods was interesting. So we bought Piaget, Vacheron. The big change was when we bought the Mannesmann watch brands. We bought Panerai. We, I also at home started the mobile phone company Vodacom, which we sold to Vodafone. We laid cables, undersea cables. So here in the world, because I don't really do a lot of talks, I'm known for luxury goods. At home, it's kind of different. Uh, our little bank has now grown to 32,000 people and we swore we'd never be more than 400 max. Uh, we've got medical uh, hospitals in Switzerland and South Africa. So there we diversified industrial and financial. I'm saying this because this gives me an insider but an outsider's look at luxury goods. Whilst I did learned all of this, the world also changed. I would say the first big change was when they broke their word to Billy Salomon and they incorporated Salomon Brothers and the partnerships disappeared. At Lazard, you didn't really need a World Bank, an IMF, any feds to regulate us. The partners regulated us. If you messed around, they went bankrupt. Trust me, those people did not need regulation. Goldman's the same. It was partnerships. Then came incorporation leverage, and then, obviously, I'll never get Bill Donaldson giggling in a hearing about the potential effects of allowing more leverage. People say it's the free market system that caused this. It's not the free market system. It's the lack of the free market system. If they'd allowed long-term John Merriweather and his men to go under when they hit the skids, people wouldn't have had a one-way bet. But we kept on supporting, interfering, supporting, interfering. Little brush fires were put out. So I did predict what happened in 87, but more importantly in 208. 
But the real thing that I want to say to you is I then predicted to my colleagues who are in the room, I said, folks, it's going to happen, but something worse is going to happen. We are going to have a tearing of the social fabric. We're going to see a resurgence of anti-Semitism. We are going to see society at one another's throats again. I had no idea of that ISIS was going to be that big. And we're going to have big structural unemployment. So that's what we've got at the moment. We've got a crowded world, or so we think. People who don't think that there's global warming must fly with me, which I've done for 30 years between Cape Town and Europe. The cumulus is getting higher every year. Every year, you can map it. We've done it for 20 years now. And we say we have an overcrowded world. If you take every single human being, 7.3 billion people and counting, and you vacuum packed every human being, in, put it in a cube like a sardine can, how big do you think that cube will be? Any guess? Not you, Frank, or Hanley, you know. You'll fit three times the world's population into a one-kilometer cube. And yet, we still, don't worry, I've checked it and checked it and checked it. I called my son to just say, I'm not going to make a fool of myself. But yet, we managed to stuff the world up. All of this before the single biggest thing is going to hit us. And that is what is so aptly described as the second machine age. We've gone from agrarian society, we domesticated the horse, then the horse went because we had the steam engine. We replaced the muscle power of horse and man. Now we've got computers and other digital advances. And the big thing here is this is exponential. It's digital and it's combinatorial. And I have to thank uh, an Austrian uh, for his book. I'll, I'll thank them later for this to try and explain the difference between counting one, two, three, four, five, six and exponentiality. We all know the Sultan and the Reis. But more interesting, if I walk from here and I walk 30 yards to, to Lionel and back, you can all see that. If I walk 30 exponential yards, anybody uh, give me an idea where I'd have to go to? Well, I'll go to the moon and back and twice around the earth. So what's happening today with artificial intelligence, robots, bots, this is not science fiction, folks. It's happening driverless cars. It's happening. It's going to put hundreds of millions of people out of work. And I urge you to read the books that I'll refer to later on. Why am I talking about this in a luxury goods conference? Because I think we're focusing on the wrong technology. We're talking about e-commerce, clicks versus bricks. I keep on being quoted incorrectly as saying I don't believe in e-commerce. Of course I believe in e-commerce. But I think e-commerce is dwarfed by what's going to hit the world with artificial intelligence and bots.
the Internet of Things. I read about it as much as I can, but it's going faster than I ever thought. So the whole discussion we had about our luxury goods from 76 up till now, laptops, it's all going to be squeezed into faster and faster. Now, in the luxury goods business, we've survived wars, we've survived depressions, we've survived... I just want to keep Tom Russo happy as a big shareholder. At Richmond, we have, I think we're the leaders in... I've got to thank Norbert Platt in data management. So we're ready. We know where our stuff is. And we know what it cost us at all times. We have Maisons that are centuries old. Our role is to protect their DNA and their brand equity. Because if we can have desirability and brand equity, then we can have pricing power. If we have pricing power, our goal, as Tom knows, is to grow by 15% per year, grow our dividends. We've done it now for 25 years, really by managing brand equity. I want to summarize by saying we discussed how we started, uh, the time it took, it's now 40 years that we've been in the business. We have a lot more competition, especially from ridiculously mispriced capital. When people misprice something, it's abused. England waters for free, it rains all the time, but there's a drought. I mean, they don't have water. Now, if you misprice capital, people will abuse it and will regret it, unfortunately, in our business as well. It starts with landlords. Yes, there are a few here who take us to the cleaners, especially in Asia. And people get... I was offered a hundred year, a billion Swiss francs, a hundred years, fixed, prime, plus 15 basis points. I, I thought it was a joke. It's not possible. And remember, Swiss prime is zero underneath. So I, I called back and said, well, no. Now, when this lunacy carries on, things are mispriced. We've survived that. I hope to survive another century. But our threat is not this immediate technology. Our threat to all of us is how are we going to organize society when the abundance hits us? Because artificial intelligence combined with robots will create abundance. But we cannot have 0.1% of 0.1% taking all the spoils. And folks, those are our clients. But it's unfair and it is not sustainable. So I don't know what new social pact we'll have, but we'd better find one. Otherwise, our clients will be targets, they'll be hated, despised, because the next wave of Unemployment is going to be even bigger than the current one. And these people will be unemployable. You don't believe me? I give you two books to read. And then think about the effects and how it will affect all of our lives. Uh, the one is the second machine age. 
and the other one is uh, a robot uh, uh, humans need not apply. A robot's going to steal your job, and don't worry, it's not going to be. It's going to be cool. But I would urge you to look at this. It's going to be more important than e-commerce and clicks versus bricks. Uh, hopefully, we will survive it because we're planning for it. Uh, it's really what keeps me awake at night that I'm telling you now. How is society going to cope with structural unemployment? And the envy, hatred, and the social, wa uh, social warfare. Because the people with money will not wish to show it. If your child's best friend's parents go unemployed, you don't want to buy a new car or, you know, anything showy. And folks, we are destroying the middle classes at this stage, and it will affect us. And it's unfair. So that's what keeps me awake at night. Not uh, whether uh, e-commerce is going to cause me problems. I think this is going to hit society far harder. Are there any questions? Okay, sorry. I think you will appreciate the thoughts a lot more once if I've enriched those two authors of the second machine age even more, because it changed my thinking, and it led me into a totally different thought process. We're in for a huge change in society. Get used to it and be prepared. Thank you. Does on call? No. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that uh, uh, uplifting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now I know why you were christened Rupert the Bear. Uh, you called me Rupert the Bear. That was the making of you, though. It was. Well, in one respect, in that you called the global financial crisis back in 2006. We um, were very lucky because I went with Gaynor to the Hamptons, and we, a friend of mine set a dinner up with a whole bunch of hedge fund managers. Lewis Bacon, Stan Druckenmiller, uh, I can't, Soros, and they all laughed their heads off at the stupid South African. And then in 2007 again, and then in 2008 again. So, but by then, uh, you also christened the three what was it, the horseman of the apocalypse. And Nuriel brought me in and he said, you're the fourth one, you're even more disgusting than we are. <laughs> <laughs> so you described yourself as the insider-outsider. And you made, I thought, a very important point about the pricing power inherent in brand equity. If you look across all your portfolios, your, your 20 children, I believe, you talk about, do you think that that portfolio now is where you want it and that there's still pricing power in all those brands? Let me try to answer it in a different way. At the watch fair, the SIHH, a gentleman from Zurich came up to me and showed me his Langenzone and he had just gone to uh, Glashütte, where he looked at the manufacture. And he came back and he said to me, your watches are too cheap. 
No, that one. That we always like hearing, so I asked him why. He said, no, whilst he was there, he had his new Range Rover serviced. And he said he checked, and he's an engineer, he checked. They basically changed the oil and the spark plugs. And he said, how much training does it take to change spark plugs and oil? But that person charged him more per hour than the people did in Glashutte. Because every Langenzone is assembled, then tested, then disassembled and cleaned and to, be make, to make sure that there's no dust and assembled again. So I think those things will survive the technological era. But what bothers me, and we're going to make an announcement now in, in June, what bothers me is that we've also been guilty of this homologate, we've homologated luxury. Uh, ubiquity, and luxury can't be ubiquitous. It must be individual. And we need style and we need design and we need creativity. Now, Europe's not very competitive in a lot of, I mean, in France, for two or three centuries, I think, therefore I am. The Americans, I do, therefore I am. There's a slight difference, okay? America, France is the only place where people are stopped from improving themselves by law. Not allowed to work for that more than 35 hours. So how do you better yourself? In France, to get a company out of liquidation or bankruptcy it takes nine years. Nine years. In America, it's less than a year. Chapter 11, in and out. Now, here we're in Europe. What have we got that we can compete with? Taste, design, culture, luxury goods. But some of the people will tell you, if you speak to them privately, that the new clientele, uh, should I say, have gotten their money quicker than in the past. So they did not stop past the culture bar en route. Yeah. Uh, and they asked the people to make things that these, the meteor art, the people who have this, they feel affronted in many ways to apply their skills to do things that the new clients want. So what we want to do uh, with a friend, Franco Colony, uh, we found it, we've got a foundation uh, to help in the method art of Europe. And we will speak to the various governments because we need to identify those artisans. Mm -hmm. And I've spoken to Federico of Jux and to Natalie and to have a platform for them because we were also guilty. We've homologated. You know, in England, you can't get proper cheese anymore because some bureaucrat says, eh? We're not allowed to choose for ourselves. Yeah. Now, with luxury goods, to give back, we'll announce in June that we want to create a platform for the little artists and artisans who sit in the little villages throughout. Hopefully those people will still be employed in the second machine age. Who are going to be working more than 35 hour working, uh, working week as well. Are you kidding me? You tell, um, but you tell, a, tell somebody in Italy they've got only work 35 hours, they laugh at you. Could you talk a little bit about the, rational, the, the rationale for the merger of Ux and Metapulte? Unlike what some magazines Just believe, set the straight. I do believe in e-commerce. But, you know when Lewis Hamilton won last night, or yesterday in, in Montreal, but last night our time, his Mercedes car 
at 200 miles an hour was sending one gigabyte of data per second, one gigabyte per second to his pit lane and it was sent via Tata Communications to Woking where they analyze it. That's big data. Yux on its own, NAP on its own, Richmond on its own. And I said to Mr. Arno the other day, forget it, LVMH on its own. We're not big enough. Was, was he trying to buy something or were you trying no, to buy something? No, no, no. I was speaking to him as I've spoken to Kering about joining us on that platform to make it totally neutral. Yeah. When we had 95% of Netapote, we ran it neutrally. The reason why, Lyle, is it's too big a game for any company to try to dominate. That's that combinatorial that they talked about last year at Google. I speak to the SAP guys, and they swallow when they talk about the cost of big data. I hear a respond. We've got like 5 billion euro. That's a hiccup to, I mean, look at Apple, look at the players. Look at IBM. Well, you haven't mentioned Amazon yet. Do you not, do you not feel threatened by Amazon? <laughs> Firstly, Amazon was never interested in buying. It was a created rumor by somebody who wanted to sell some shares. Okay, it's yeah, nonsense. Don't, don't look at me, I, I don't do no, that. No. Kind of not Amazon shares, some NAP shares. But have you seen the capex of Amazon? It's a fantastic million. business for me who sits in Africa. I press a button and I get a book. I've been using it for 20 odd years. I think I was one of their first 100 customers. Great business. I'm not sure if, as a shareholder it's a phenomenal business. I'm not sure. It's they eating capital. Uh, so, uh, you mentioned Apple. Yeah. Do you think that your high quality watch business is threatened by the smartwatch? You know, I've refrained from commenting on that because Johnny Ives is a friend and I, Mark Newsom is a friend and I really admire their work. But, there's a bit of a contradiction between technology and luxury, as in value and perennity. Uh, I'll let you in, when our son was in his gap year, we have these product committee meetings, and there's some people here who were at that product committee meeting where the Cartier people wanted to make a mobile phone. And my son, very quiet, he just, started getting very fidgety. He was saying to me, are they mad? Are they insane? Mom keeps her boxes that Cartier products come in. You don't throw Cartier away. And everybody throws a phone away after two years. Are they mad? But I said, let them carry on. And they carried on. They really wanted to make a mobile phone. Uh, and then he said to me, where are they going to have it serviced if there's a problem? I said, I'm going to let them carry on. And afterwards, I, I let them have it. I said, are you totally, utterly mad? I mean, are, you, are you insane? Cartier is not to be thrown away. Now, how many generations? This is eight, eight years, ten years, eight years ago. That phone would not have been as good as a Nokia 6310, which at least you could keep because the battery life was a week. It couldn't take pictures. It would have been thrown away. Now do you expect me to pay $17,000 and throw something away in two years' time? But it's a threat. I think it is the richy, stupid strategy, and I don't think it's that smart. I mean, you don't treat clients like fools. To spend $17,000 and you know in two years' time it's in a drawer because the technology is that old, I, they'll sell a ton of them. 
I think our colleagues' uh, thinking of doing the same thing but putting it on a watch strap is a bit of lateral thinking. So we're going to put them on straps. So you get all the data on the strap and all the beauty and last No, thing. no, you get your data on your iPhone. Right. So what's because on the Because this is just the remote control. Ah. I mean, I've seen it now in meetings where people look, and after three looks, every time it vibrates, their colleagues get irritated. So, you know, you're wasting our time. Now, switch the thing off or get out. It's not a very social thing. No, it's what do you use it for? You get a message, there's an email. Well, if you've got it on vibrate, you get that. It tells you when you've died already. It doesn't tell you you're going to die because it tells your pulse has stopped, which is of great value to everybody but me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, keep cheering us up. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> Hey, says somebody who's got a thing on his right arm. But what I'm trying to say, the internet of things, yes, proximity. But I don't know, anybody here has got a Range Rover Sport in London? Nobody. You can't get insurance. Why? Because they can scan the door open for something that costs under $5 that you can buy on the internet. Guess what? The insurer said, unless you've got off-road parking, zero insurance. So when you start doing access control on a watch or banking on a watch, you'd better make very, very sure that... So there are people in Switzerland that have now devised a watch strap that reads your veins, which is like a fingerprint. It's this technology that's jumping all the time. I think Apple will do well. I'm their biggest fan. But I'm not sure that, okay. Your wife's got a birthday. You've got a choice of taking her X or an Apple Watch. Mm. I'm not sure you're going to do better, and I'll use opposition watches as well if you go with a Cartier or a Bulgari. I'm not sure she's not going to love you more. <laughs> if you no, if your daughter turns 18 or 21, you want to give her something that she's going to remember for the rest of her life. That's where I envy the Patek Philippe ad so much. You never really own it. You know, you, you know, it's investment. Before we have time to throw it open, I just got one question which fascinates me. No, you're not going to win the World Cup, England. No. <laughs> well, but Ben told me. That, well, you can't tell me the box are going to win. No. Surely. No, I'm pulling your leg. Okay, good. Okay. Well, that's reassuring. Um, you talked about Switzerland. What, what's been the impact? Or how, how are you dealing with the unpaying of the Swiss franc? I mean, this is an extraordinary move, wasn't it, by the Central you know, Bank? You know, everybody, critis everybody criticized Mr. Jordan. I don't think... He's, he's the Swiss bank governor. He's yeah. the governor. I actually don't think he had a choice. And I actually think the fact that he did it in the middle of the market... Ballsy. ...was really interesting because now the markets are edgy forever. They're never going to know what to do, how to handle it. I thought the original pegging was a little bit bold. Because as I've said, Stan Druckenmiller is a good friend. And when uh, Norman Lamont, uh, remember with a pound, I mean, you never go and tell the market you've pegged something. 
I mean, it's a one-way bet. And they were betting, and when he heard then that the QE uh, 3, 525, whatever, of the ECB was coming again, he had no option. He had to unpeg. But Norman Lamont said he, he was singing in his bath when the uh, pound was unpegged in the ERM. What was he singing? No, that's the <laughs> okay. no, I don't know. But, no, but how has it affected us? Obviously, it's increased our operating, uh, operating costs. But you know what? If you look at Germany and what they did, uh, as a friend of mine said, never waste a good recession. Okay? Never waste an opportunity to fine-tune your business even more. So and, what are you doing? And Switzerland a, is a very good place to do business. Yeah. And the workers, I mean, we have f factories in the French part of Switzerland. So they had a vote. Should Switzerland get extra holidays, paid holidays? And the Swiss workers said, no, we have enough. The French workers in our factories told our Swiss workers, are you out of your mind? Are you crazy? They want to give you extra holidays? And the Swiss said, no, we have enough holidays. Now, do you not like working in a place like that? The people, and by the way, technically, they are brilliant. This is the Swiss? Yep, absolutely. Right. So, no, so, you know, Swatch was, didn't just fall out of the sky. Right. Was, was that a, a, a statement in the, the long-term confidence in the French economy? I think, frankly, if I have envy, it's for the lifestyle of the French. I mean, it's just the most beautiful place on earth, the best wine, best food. But, you know... They need a Thatcher-like revolution there, otherwise they're going to have real issues. Well, they've already got real issues. Yes. Did you have anybody in mind? No, I'm not involved. I mean, uh, it's, all I'm saying is, you guys weren't doing that great before Mrs. Thatcher arrived either. That's true. Okay. So, I remember the, f the coal miner strikes, etc. I was young, but I remember it. In France, they just need to find the leader. Uh, yes, just on Asia, you, you mentioned how you were being, uh, how ridiculous um, prices. Uh, actually, you didn't say that, so I'm not going to misquote you, but if you look at Hong Kong and Macau, there's been mm. a serious downturn. Is that cyclical, or is it something deeper? It's there's uh, Lord Sir David Tang. I'd rather ask him. No, but if... You know when David shoot me, but if you're 80 to 100 million people in the Communist Party, about 90 million, correct? You're running a country with 1.3 billion people. If you have to make a law that you're not allowed to have military number plates on Ferraris, Bentleys, and Roses, then do you smell a bit of corruption? So, if you are a, such a minority, I'm not talking about using it to get rid of political opponents, I don't know. But it's a very wise thing to do. So I don't think the anti-corruption is going to stop. It's going to continue, isn't I it? I think it's going to continue. The, uh, the Does that stop the Chinese propensity Remember, they were civilized when all our forefathers were running around in caves somewhere. They chose the wrong philosophy for a short period. But as David said, things are coming back to normal. The normal status symbol of a mistress is reappearing, eh, David? Correct? So, uh, sorry? Four mistresses, which is great for our business. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. No, China, why, why is China great for our business? People are smart, they work like hell, they save, and 
there are more men than women. So are they going to get lucky? Think about it. They're going to have to be very generous to the women. And when you add and you look at the numbers, it's... But they're so sensitive. We dropped our prices in Hong Kong, our dollar region prices, increased our euro region prices. The Chinese visitors landed in Dubai, but they didn't buy anything in April. Because every tour operator's got a spreadsheet that'll give them the exact prices per currency, per country. These are smart shoppers. The moment we adjusted, they started shopping in Dubai. But our shoppers are there. Our shoppers, the Chinese will shop in Paris, or, yeah, we've got to go, but Paris, London, they'll shop, and increasingly Japan. Japan's Japan coming, is becoming a very big destination yes. for traveling Chinese. Yes. Yeah, I was there just so, uh, three weeks ago. I'm, look, so one, it's a blip? No, I wouldn't call it a blip. A blop? No, man. Ralph Lauren and I are really good friends. We finally nailed it when he said to him, you are as paranoid as I am, aren't you? <laughs> I said, yes. You know, if you have a healthy dose of paranoia, you kind of survive. So I don't know. But we've got five engines, five continents, uh, and you know, Coco Chanel said, money is money, it's money, it's only the pockets that change. And it's true. Oil prices go down, somebody else makes money. Oil prices go up, our sales go up in the Middle East. We've just got to remain true to the brand equity. Uh, so that's, by the way, to keep my big shareholder there happy, my co-shareholder, Mr. Tom Rousseau. We've got time for just two questions from the floor. Uh, so who would like to step up into the lion's den? Yes, ma'am. Hold on, just wait for the microphone and if you'd like to identify yourself. I'm Susan Owens, I'm a journalist um, for Jing Daily. I just wondered how your uh, conversation with Mr. Arno and Mr. Pino is progressing in terms of your platform for artisans and protecting and growing them, knowing that Chanel have started to do that. Chanel did jewelry with Natalie, but what I said to them was they can come in and get equity in the company if they commit maisons because I wanted to be a neutral, or a, a caring's already using NAP. But what I said to them is, look, I don't want you to blame me afterwards for not inviting you, but it's up to you. Uh, I think it's in your interest. It's certainly in all of our interest. And it's run totally neutrally. And I think you can ask the caring people, uh, they'll tell you that it's absolutely unbiased. In fact, at times I got annoyed that some of the opposition got better uh, uh, coverage. I don't think any of us on our own can do it. And. Uh, I just want it to be for everybody. It really is a, the question that was asked about why did we merge? We need a platform that's big enough for the luxury goods industry. And uh, that's neutral. Oh, well, okay. just the, the, the lady in the front, yeah. please. Sorry, there's a lot of questions I know, but... The time. Hello, I'm Lizzie Zita. I'm a fashion journalist. I wanted to go back to what okay. you were talking about, the lack of jobs in the future. I have a 12-year-old daughter, Chiara. 
What industries do you think will be buoyant in 10 years' time? Okay, um, there are two more. Okay, I'll be very needed. quick. Yeah. I'm a chancellor of a university, and I tell people, go and read those books. And hairdressers will be employed. Florists will be employed. A doctor that does diagnostic work, forget it. You're gonna go through a scanner, they're gonna look at your blood, big data, and they're gonna... So it's not always obvious who will lose their jobs. But check, go on uh, the internet, go to look at YouTube. They've got brilliant, brilliant summaries. I tell all the kids before they go to college, university, we'd say, read this, watch this, and then decide. Uh, there were two others at the, yeah, gentleman in the blue shirt because we do have a little, just mm, a tiny yeah, bit more yeah. time. Then I'll go over the other side, maybe. Hi, uh, Zachary Sachs with Waddell and Reed. Sorry to say former shareholder, but potential in the future. Um, just curious about the fast-moving nature of information these days. You're talking about big data. How do you, how do you envision your companies potentially innovating faster? I mean, it's something about Cartier and Piaget is its timelessness, but in an environment where data move faster, consumers are more responsive to innovations effectively. Um, are they looking increasingly for timelessness or is it important for Cartier to innovate more? Okay, thank you. One of the biggest compliments you can give me is to say we don't innovate at all which means we stay so true to the DNA of the brand that you don't notice that it's a new product. So thank you. Well, let's dispatch to the boundary. No, it's not. It is not. Uh, I, no, I, 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 no, I get a... this all the time. Yeah. I get this all the time, but yeah, we've got Giampiero Bordino and people here. 25% of the products must be new but you've got to stay within the DNA. If you don't stay within the DNA, it won't sell and it will not have lasting value. Look at Sotheby's and Christie's and look at what are the products, whether they be rings, whatever, watches, that keep their value and go up over time. There's your indicator. You, do you, know, do you eat slow food, etc. Is there, could you give me one example of where you think you innovated and you were not true to the DNA? Just one. Oh, my Lord. That watch, uh, uh, that, that, that phone would have been one. Uh, where did we innovate and not stay? Oof. There was a watch, a divan watch. Okay. It was one of the worst things we ever did uh, about 15 years ago. Now they're a couple. They're a couple, don't worry. Question from over there, last one. Anywhere? They're all being... They're at the back? Yes. Ah, yes, ma'am. Yes. Do you want to take the microphone to, all the way to the back there? There's the a lady just... there. There's a lady who wants to... Okay. Where's sorry. the microphone? All right. Do Hi. stand up. Ah, oh, yeah, there we are. Hello, I'm Astrid Van Plant, and I write about the luxury goods industry for Reuters. Um, you alluded to speaking to Bernard Arnault and caring about maybe them potentially investing. Is it in a separate platform or the newly created platform that you're forming with net and Nukes? If you could clarify. Uh, look, it's, these are merely hypotheses. We have no idea where we're going six months a year from now. What I want to do is to establish one platform that's open to everyone. If they want separate platforms, c'est la vie. It's up to them. I just extended the hand of friendship, that was all. Uh, and by the way, it's not only them. You know, Mr. Uh, Armani is already on it. So it's it's everyone. If Valentino wants 
everybody. We've got Valentino here. If we can't do it better than they can do it themselves, then there's something wrong with us. Johan Rupert, thank you very much thank for that conversation. I hope it, you didn't feel it was too much of a trip to the dentist chair. Uh, for me, certainly, it was a great pleasure listening to you. Thank you. You owe me big time. I know. <laughs> <laughs>